Now, in two-dimensional Hilbert space, we have observables, and um, observables of particular importance are the Pauli operators or the Pauli observables. Um, I'm sure you all know the Pauli matrices. Um, I'm sure you've encountered these in your quantum mechanics course. In uh, quantum computation or quantum information, the observables, the Pauli observables, are commonly denoted by X, Y, Z. You perhaps you know another notation. Um, perhaps you know them as sigma one, two, three, or sigma X, Y, Z. Um, that's of course also a possible notation, but since they appear so often, one doesn't want to use subscripts and one usually uses simply the letters X, Y, Z for the Pauli operators. And in the standard basis, uh, these Pauli operators have the matrix representation that you certainly all know. Uh, these are the Pauli matrices X, Y, and Z, and we will use these a lot. Now it's clear that these are Hermitians, so they are observables. In, uh, in your quantum mechanics course, you uh, probably discussed that they are related to the spin one half of a particle, spin one half of an electron. Um, here, we don't care what physically this corresponds to, whether this is a spin one half or whether this corresponds to polarization degrees of freedom of a photon. We are sort of agnostic. We don't care about the precise physical meaning because we, we want to abstract from the physical information carrier. We just say we have a qubit described in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, whatever this corresponds to physically. And for this qubit, we can define Pauli observables, Pauli operators, and they have this matrix representation that you all know in the standard basis. A few properties um, that will come in handy, just as a reminder, all the Pauli matrices have zero trace. Um, and a few more properties that uh, probably re you remember, the squares of all the Pauli matrices are equal to the unit operator. And when you multiply Pauli uh, operators with each other, then the result is again a Pauli operator. For example, Pauli X times Pauli Y is I times Pauli Z and so on. Yeah? Again, when you, when you have in the back of your mind the meaning of a spin, and that is an angular momentum, then what's behind these relations are the commutation relations, the properties of angular momentum. Yeah? But once again, we, we want to abstract from that. We just look at these mathematical properties. And finally, the um, eigenvalues of all three Pauli operators are plus and minus one. Now, these are three specific examples of observables um, in, for a qubit in two-dimensional Hilbert space. And quite generally, an observable can also be visualized with the help of the Bloch sphere. And I want to show you this um, in the specific example of the um, uh, Pauli X operator. This is the Pauli X uh, matrix. Now, what does the Pauli X operator do when it's applied to a basis state? Well, the, this form of the um, matrix tells us 
when we apply the Pauli X operator to a basis state zero, then the result is the basis state one. And when we apply the Pauli X operator to basis state one, then the result is the basis state zero. So the, the, the Pauli X operator flips the basis states. Yeah? Um, perhaps you can already um, anticipate that in uh, later in an algorithm, this is a little bit like in a, in a classical circuit, the not operation, yeah? it flips a qubit from the zero to the one state and vice versa. Now let's see, uh, we also introduced the, these, this other basis plus and minus, and let's see what happens when we apply the Pauli X operator to a plus or minus state. So the plus or minus state, that's this linear combination of zero and one a basis states with a plus or a minus in between and the one over square root of two. Now, what does the Pauli X applied to basis state zero do? It flips it to the basis state one and also with the second contribution, it flips the one to a zero. Yeah. So um, if we have a plus state, then the result is, um, and let me just exchange the order, um, then we have the upper sign, then the result is zero plus one, right, which is the plus state. Or if we have the lower sign, then in the round bracket, we have one minus zero, which is the same as minus one over square root of two, and then zero minus one. Oops. And this is minus the minus state. So in short, this is plus or minus the plus or the minus state. So what you see from that is that the, the plus state is an eigenstate of Pauli X with eigenvalue plus one, and the minus state is an eigenstate of Pauli X with eigenvalue minus one. Uh, so in fact, the plus and the minus state are the eigenstates of Pauli X. They are the eigenbases of Pauli X. Now, quite generally, um, every Hermitian operator, and therefore every observable, is uniquely determined, uniquely specified by its eigenbasis, by its eigenstates, and by the associated eigenvalues. So, and on the Bloch sphere, yeah, we just have it's two-dimensional Hilbert space. We just have for any observable, we just have two eigenstates um, in an eigenbasis. Uh, the elements of an eigenbasis are always orthogonal to each other. Yeah? And we said orthogonal states in on the Bloch sphere, they are antipodal states. They are at opposite ends, yeah? like the plus and the minus states. So um, and we can use that to visualize the observable on the Bloch sphere. First of all, we say, well, the eigen states of Pauli X, they are the plus and the minus states. Yeah? And they are, I mark them here with the black dots. And they are on opposite sides of the Bloch sphere. And then we can associate with each of the eigenstates the corresponding eigenvalues. So we have the plus state on the right, 
with eigenvalue plus one, and we have the minus state on the left with associated eigenvalue minus one. So you can visualize an observable, and you can do that for any other observable. We did that here in the example of Pauli X, but you can do that for any other observable. You will always find that the observable can be visualized as two points on the Bloch sphere, which are antipodal. And then you can just write the associated eigenvalues um, at the two ends of this um, of this axis. Yeah? And so one way to, um, uh, to, to, to see that is to say, well, well when you measure an observable, um, you have two possible outcomes for a qubit corresponding to, to, the, to the two sides of this, uh, to the two antipodes. Yeah? I can visualize the measurement itself as the axis connecting the two. Now, after the measurement, uh, you get one of the two results. And then after the measurement, you do a state update, which is a projection onto the eigenstate uh, for the eigenvalue that you measured. So the post-measurement state is one of the two endpoints. And the value that you measured in your measurement, that's the value attached to that endpoint. Yeah. So uh, remember, an observable for a qubit, you can imagine that as an axis going through the center of the sphere, and then the two endpoints uh, correspond to the two eigenstates, and then you can just attach the eigenvalues to the endpoints. Then let's move on to probabilities. Now, for example, imagine that you have um, a qubit in a pure state corresponding to this point E on the Bloch sphere. And then you perform a measurement. You, me you measure the observable that corresponds to the vertical axis, to the Z axis, with the two possible outcomes corresponding to the North Pole and the South Pole. So the eigenstates um, are the basis states 0 and 1. Which observable does that correspond to? Which observable has as its eigenstates the basis states 0 and 1? I think the um, sigma z um, exactly. Matrix. exactly, exactly. It's the Pauli Z operator, and uh, the corresponding Pauli matrix is diagonal yeah, with entries plus one and minus one. It's diagonal in the standard basis, in the zero one basis. So it has the basis states as its eigenstates. Yeah, so measure, so imagine that you measure Pauli Z. Um, with the two possible outcomes represented by the two gray dots, North Pole and the South Pole. Now, what is the probability that you get the, uh, the North Pole in your measurement? You find the North Pole in your measurement. Yeah? You get the measurement outcome corresponding to the basis state zero. And let's imagine that between the two points on the Bloch sphere, you have the angle delta theta. Then to calculate this probability, you just have to take the um, parameterization of the pure state E in terms of the two angles, theta and phi and take the coefficient in front of the basis state zero and take its absolute value squared. That's the probability of finding the outcome corresponding to basis state zero. And the coefficient in our parameterization with the angles, that was the cosine of theta over two and 
the absolute value squared, it's just the cosine squared. Yeah. I'm sure you all know what the cosine squared looks like, but it, uh, for also for future reference, it may be helpful to look at a few special values. Obviously, when the angle is uh, zero, then this probability is equal to one. If you go sort of one eighth of a semicircle, then this probability is 0.96. If you go as one sixth of the semicircle, it's a bit smaller, still a quarter of a semicircle, and so on, gets smaller and smaller. If you go a, a third of a semicircle, then the probability is three quarters. If you go half the semicircle, so basically your E lies on the equator of the Bloch sphere, then the probability is one half. And finally, if you go all the way down to the South Pole, then obviously um, it's certain that the measurement will yield the so South Pole and the probability for the North Pole becomes zero. And when you con connect all these dots, then you get the familiar curve for the cosine squared. Uh, 